Hello, friends, and welcome to the Fire in You program. We are extremely excited about what God is going to do tonight. Amen. He's excited every time. I'm excited every Wednesday <laughs> because the word of the Lord is going forth. So we're again, we welcome you to the Fire in You program. Now, my name is Apostle Michael. This is my wife, Evelyn. Apostle Evelyn, the prophet in the house. And um, God has really been speaking to her, and, and there's been some great downloads that, have, that she's been sharing with us uh, regarding altars in the high places. And they have been extremely powerful. And we believe that th tonight is going to be just as powerful. Amen. Mm -hmm. So one way you can continue to even follow us uh, and what we're doing is by subscribing to our YouTube channel, right? Mm -hmm have a great YouTube channel with a lot of powerful things on there. So you want to make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also follow us on Facebook, right? Give us those likes and things of that nature. It's always pretty cool. When I pop up Facebook and I see some likes there, that's cool. And uh, also, uh, we also have a Twitter account, so you can follow us on Twitter. And also check us out on Instagram. We're on Instagram, too. We're on all those media outlets because we want to make sure that the word of the Lord gets out. Amen. And thank you so much for your giving. And we we pray regularly for our givers, really for just our our, our viewing audience, but yes. our friends, our family. But we thank you very specifically for the gifts that you have given them to this ministry because we couldn't do what we do without you. So we thank you for that. Mm -hmm. This is good ground to sow your seed. And we we are committed to make sure that what you give unto us is used for the kingdom of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I know uh, Apostle still has a, a thing where if you give a hundred dollars or more, uh, we'll send you one of these great cups uh, that yes. says Seed of Nations International Center, yes. C-E-N-T-R-E, -E, right there on, <laughs> on the cup. Uh, but it's really just a, 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 a good opportunity. Even when you have this cup, you'll remember us mm -hmm. and you'll also keep us lifted up in prayer. In prayer, yes. Amen. 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 So again, um, what God has been sharing with you, uh, Apostle, has been very challenging and it's been very strategic. And we've watched how uh, over the last six, seven weeks as you've been doing this particular series, how it's been uh, growing and there's a, uh, there's a great an anticipation for every, every week now the next thing that God downloads because this is fresh. Some of these things she's just getting like today and yesterday fresh off the press but it's straight from god's heart so Amen. we're excited about it so we're going to get out of the way we bless you thank cover you. you in the blood of jesus as you deliver the word of god thank you. Amen. amen amen thank you apostle and i also want to remind everyone that we will be we have a new project where we have the opportunity to serve 600 to 700 individuals that's men women children families single moms with their children we're going to be providing them with hygiene kits. But in addition to that, we also will be providing them with blankets and socks, much needed socks. And this is, we're going to an area that's uh, really impoverished and we will be taking pictures and whatnot and sharing some of the things that we'll be encountering there. But really, if you want to partner with us, we would love for you to partner with us through your financial giving. It would help us to purchase the additional items that these families are in need of. All right. So I just wanted to put that out there. We're heading out in May. So you have a little time still to sow that seed. Amen. All right. Well, let's continue with our series on um, altars in the high places. And I kind of just want to do a real quick review in the sense that uh, when we take a look at an altar, what is an altar? The altar is the um, that place of sacrifice. It's a place of worship. So our mind can worship God. There's uh, the scripture out there tells us that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our what? Mind. So our mind is an altar. Our heart is an altar. Why? Because we can worship God with our mind. We can worship God with our heart. And that's really in essence what the altar is all about. It's that place of worship and that place of prayer. So I just kind of wanted to remind us of that. So the altar is also that point, that spiritual point of contact. And the altar, whether it's an altar of God or an altar to the enemy, both have supernatural activity taking place there. 
So we don't want to underestimate the power that is working at that altar. The source behind the altar can influence a, a land, a people. It can influence a land, a nation. It can influence your life. It could in, even influence your generations, your posterity as well. Uh, you also will see where there are generational altars in the family. And the way that we could recognize that generational altar, which we're going to be doing a teaching on as well. But right now, when we take a look at a generational altar, it's that pattern, right, that we see happen over and over and over again. So if there's very specific patterns taking place in your life or in your family, then just know that there is an altar, what we call a generational altar, that is in your family that needs to be dealt with, okay? And like I said, we're going to be doing a series on that um, further down the road. But we're reminded that in this season, God is calling us to tear down these demonic altars and to establish his altars or repair his altars. And we can do that again through our worship and we can do that through prayer. Those are different ways that these altars of God can be established. Um, what I'd like to do at this point is let's go over to 1 Kings. I want to read a little bit here from 1 Kings chapter 18. And I, I'm wanting to go here because this is where we're going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, this is where we're going to dive in just a little bit more into what altars are and i want us to take a look at the nation of israel and see what took place there so again first kings chapter 18 and we're going to begin with verse 19 and i'm going to be reading from the new king james version so first kings chapter 18 verse 19 reads like this now therefore send and gather all israel to me on mount carmel the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And this is the prophet Elijah who is speaking to Ahab at this point. Okay, So Elijah was a prophet of God. And we're going to talk a little bit more about his role in this whole Mount Carmel experience. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? In other words, how long are you going to straddle that fence? How long are you going to be lukewarm? How long are you going to you know, decide God one day and not the next day? Is what Elijah is asking at this point. He says this, if the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, follow him. In other words, whoever your God is, serve him and stop this compromise and this mixing that is taking place. And a lot, um, Elijah was seeing a lot of that mixing and that compromise where they would take what was of God and mix it with what was false. And then they would come up with this contaminated or defiled blend of religion and God was not for that. So he was saying, basically, decide, who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve God? If you're going to serve him, serve him with everything that you've got. And if you're going to serve Baal, then by all means, serve him. All right. Not that God is condoning service to false gods. What he's saying really is make a decision either way. But the straddling of that fence and that lukewarmness is not the thing that God is in favor of. All right. So let's go on. And I'm continuing to read in verse 21. It says, but the people answered him not a word. Oftentimes we find ourselves in this place where we know that we're not doing right, right? I mean, it's happened to me. We're not doing right. And then God begins to talk to us or he begins to talk to us through wise, godly counsel. And we get quiet because we know in our heart of hearts that thing is not right. And that's what God was speaking here through his prophet. Elijah. But basically what he's saying is, hey, decide who you're going to serve. And the people knew we've been compromising. And so because they knew that they were compromising, they weren't willing to answer the prophet in terms of 
who are they serving and who will they serve? Let's go on to verse 22. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God, I love this part, the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered. So now the people are talking, right? So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. In other words, you know, Elijah, we like what you said. And we're in agreement. Whoever answers by fire, that is God. Now Elijah, verse 25. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first. For you are many and call on the name of your God, but no fire under it. Put no fire under it. So they took the bull, which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry loud. For he is a God, either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So Elijah knew this is not a real God. And so he begins to what? Mock their God. Verse 28. So they cried aloud and cut themselves as was their custom. Let me pa pause right there. So some of the things that were taking place at these false altars was cutting. Literal, literally, they would take um their swords and and whatnot and they would begin cutting their flesh because that was again a form of worship to this particular god that they were serving twisted isn't it all right let me go on so <clears throat> go back to verse 20 the beginning of 28 so they cried aloud and cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them and so this is a pretty bloody scene at this point and usually when you're serving these false gods, you're going to find that there is a lot of blood. Every, every altar will require some sort of sacrifice. The blood sacrifice, Christ already took care of that. We don't have to shed our blood because Christ already did. That's why we know that this is a false god. False gods will always demand the shedding of your blood or someone's blood. Whereas our God, will, he's not going to demand that anymore because his son, Jesus Christ, already did that. He already shed his blood at the cross. Verse 29, and when midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, now he's speaking to the nation of Israel, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar. This is key. Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken. All right, verse 31. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seahs of seed and he put the wood in order cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and said fill your water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice on the wood all right and so then elijah instructs them to do it what a second time and then a third time so elijah's making a point right now right because the other god that these guys were serving didn't answer they cut themselves up they shed blood right but there was no answer from their god so Elijah is making a point by saying, soak the sacrifice, soak the altar, soak the wood. All right. And so we, as we read on, and I really want to encourage you guys to read 1 Kings chapter 18. As we read on, they, they do, they, they pour all this water on the sacrifice. And then Elijah calls on 
his God, the true and living God. And he says, basically, I've done all that you have asked me to do, Lord. Hear me. I, I, I've done this. You know your people. And um, he goes on um, that he, he was sent to turn their hearts back to God. True prophets of God will always, their desire is God's desire, and that's to turn the heart of the people back to God. God will also give a word through his prophets to encourage us, right? But he also will give a word that will turn them from serving other gods, false gods, or any form of discouragement or depression or whatever the case may be, something that will speak life to them rather than death. The true prophets of God, all right? So we go on and we read in verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering. Now I want to drop down to verse 39. Now when all the people saw it, this is key, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. They fell on their faces. That means that once they saw how God answered by fire, right, they fell on their faces, in other words, to worship God. They recognize this is a true altar, and this is the true God, and they were provoked to fall on their faces. So usually, that's another form of worship as well. It's not just songs and whatnot, as we have said before, but when we fall on our faces, when we bow down before God, what we are doing is we are worshiping God. So it, let me read it again, verse 39. Now, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and this is what they said, right? And they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Amen? And so we see during this time some interesting dynamics taking place here. And if you will just allow me, give me a few minutes to set up biblical history um, as it occurred here. So kind of going back a bit. Omri was a king, and Omri was the father of Ahab. And Omri worshipped idols, and he led the whole nation into this false worship as well. And so the word tells us clearly that Omri provoked God to anger through this worship. So it tells us that he was uh, another wicked king, Omri was, but Omri had a son, as I said before, and his son was named Ahab. So when Omri dies, Ahab then becomes king, right? This is a dynasty, and it's passed on from one king to another. But what's interesting here is the word of God tells us that Ahab was more wicked than his father, Omri, and that he was Ahab was more wicked than uh, any of the other kings put together. That's, that's pretty wicked. Right? So then, as if it were nothing, as if it were no big deal, Ahab goes and he marries Ethbaal's daughter, Jezebel. And so now we have this extreme wickedness entering into a covenant, into a marriage with another form of wickedness. That's important for us to know and to realize. One form of wickedness will always attract another form of wickedness. All right. And we want to make sure that we don't get caught up in that. And one of the ways that we do that, aside from serving the one and true living God, is when we find ourselves in that situation, repent. Even David, King David, found himself doing one wicked thing after another. And it wasn't until he realized what he was doing that he repented. All right. So oftentimes we see that sin begets sin. And sometimes we can get so steeped in that sin that we don't even realize how bad the situation is. We don't realize just how deep our sin is or how deeply we are involved. All right. So here again, Ahab marries Jezebel, two wicked people coming together. And what ends up happening is that Ahab builds a temple to this false altar or to this false god of theirs, all right, which is Baal and Ashtoreth. So they, he builds an, uh, a temple and he builds an altar to both of these gods, all right? And so what we find is that through this process, this really provoked God to anger. So Ahab provoked God to anger like no other king before him, all right? 
And in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of this, these temples being built to these false gods and built to these, um, these idol worshipers, and in the midst of all of the sin, suddenly God takes this man named Elijah, who is a prophet, and literally just drops him on the scene. Right? When we go take when we go back in history and try to find out a lot of information about Elijah, we don't. But what's important here, and, and I share this when I teach classes on the prophetic, is that oftentimes people wonder why are all these prophets suddenly on the scene? Why is the prophet this, prophet that? And every there seems to be prophets everywhere. It's because when the government is not acting right, is not acting in accordance to the word of God, the law of God, these governments, whatever government it may be, they provoke God to anger. Because what is happening is, what they're doing is they're, in essence, building various altars. And these altars are forms of worship, not to our true and living God, but to these other gods. And it provokes our Heavenly Father to anger. And so, in the midst of all this chaos and altar building and temple building and everything else, God takes this prophet, and like I said before, and kind of just drops him into the scene. And why does he do that? Well, because these Israelites, these are the, the people after, the, these are um, the apple of God's eye, right? These are his chosen people, and they know better and yet they are worshiping these gods. One might ask, well, why were the Israelites worshiping these gods? But before I answer that question, I want to share this with you. Let's take a look at how these people, the Israelites, how were they treating God? Because this is going to be key to everything. How were they treating God? They were being disobedient to God. They were being rebellious and stubborn. They were worshiping idols and sin. Remember how I said earlier that sin begets sin? Well, disobedience is a sin. And when we disobey God, we enter into another sin called rebellion and enter into another sin called stubbornness and enter into another sin of what? Idol worshiping. Or, you know what? The idol doesn't just is not just a graven image or a statue. You could worship another human being because you're putting that human being above God. And in that moment, even your stubborn, excuse me, even through stubbornness, excuse me, even through stubbornness, you could be doing what? Serving that idol worship. Why? Because stubbornness, you're, you're worshiping yourself. Stubbornness is contrary to God. And anything that is contrary to God, you're either, it's either going to be a worship of, of that man or that woman or it's going to be a worship of that wickedness, but it's not the worship of the one and true living God. Stubbornness opposes God. And when we stay in that place of stubbornness, what ends up happening is we're worshiping ourselves. Interesting, isn't that? So we see where Ahab and Jezebel, they built these altars to what? False gods. And the word tells us that Ahab and Jezebel caused the nation of Israel to sin. Ahab did more evil, as I said before, than all these previous kings. Because what? Not only did he have sin and join sin, but then he caused a whole nation to do what? To sin. So, um, <clears throat> what ended up happening is that when God sent this prophet Elijah on the scene, it's because these two representatives of the government, Ahab and Jezebel, these they were um, not on, only building temples and altars, but they were dividing the nation via this false worship. Did you know that? So what happens is you're going to get some people that will, we saw it on Mount Carmel, right? That we ju where The scripture that we just read, where some were worshiping God and some were worshiping the false gods. So there's a division that takes place and God is not about division. God is about unity. We find that when he sends Ahab, he sends, or excuse me, when he sends Elijah, the prophet Elijah, he sends him to deal with Ahab, to deal with Jezebel, deal with these false prophets, you know, deal with this dividing of nations, deal with these people who have turned their back to me. 
this is God speaking, who have turned their back to me, you know, through this false worship, reestablish my righteous worship by reestablishing or repairing the altar of God. I want the people healed. I want the land healed. I want the nation healed. I want these false altars to these uh, false gods. I want them destroyed. So how does God do that? He has to get our attention because oftentimes God speaks to us and speaks to us and speaks to us and speaks to us and we don't listen. And when we don't listen, then he'll send someone else to speak to us, right? And it could be in the form of a prophet. And God wanted this prophet to get the attention of the Israelites through what? Through this drought. Because what ended up happening is Elijah declares a drought in the previous chapter. He declares a drought in the land. And he says, it will not rain until I say so. Now, he wasn't being haughty. But he was so sure of his relationship with God, he knew the heart of God. And though it hurt the heart of God, he had to get the people's attention some kind of way, which is where this drought gets introduced, and this drought leads to famine. And the Israelites, rather than seeking God out for the root cause of this drought, rather than seeking God out for the root cause of this famine what really what what's the root cause here like what really took place why are we experiencing this dryness this drought this famine now why are we experiencing not only a physical hunger but why are we experiencing a spiritual hunger let's look at it that that way remember these are parallels so we have a physical hunger as well as a spiritual hunger so we we can have a physical drought where the land is dry, but then we, we're land because God took us from the land. We could be dry inside as well. And we have to take a look at what the root cause of that dryness is. And we can't run to all these different gods in our life, all these different people and whatnot to find out what the root cause of it is. We go before the, the Lord to do that. But the nation of Israel found it easier I mean, how often do we come across a situation in our lives and we, rather than dealing with the situation, we find that, or we feel in that moment, well, if I just walk away from this, if I ignore this, if I don't, if I look to this as being the problem rather than the real problem, it'll get fixed, it'll go away, but something good will come of it, right? And maybe we don't word it that way, but that has been our experience. And then we find that things are going from bad to worse and worse. Why? Because we haven't come to that place where we identify what the root cause is of that dryness in our lives. Uh, why did our finances dry up? You know, why is it that for every, every time I spend money, it just seems like I have holes in my pocket? And God is telling us, I need you to go back. I need you to take... You know, seek me out to find out what the root cause is. Don't walk away from it. Don't ignore it. Don't stuff it. Don't choose not to deal with it because eventually it's going to, it's going to resurface some kind of way. And that's what the Israelites found out. They chose, an, I call it an easier route. I, that's just me though. The Bible does not tell us that. But I believe they chose an easier route and their easier route was Hey, we're going to worship the God of the land, Baal and Ashtaroth, um, Asherah, excuse me. And it could be maybe they felt pressure into, you know, when you've got a lot of wickedness around you and you've got a, people all around you um, doing things that are not right, there, there's this uh, pressure on the person or people or people group that are trying to live right. There seems to be this pressure on them and they're that's where the cancel culture comes in but we're not going to talk about that too much here all right but these guys ended up these guys the nation of israel ended up worshiping what baal and ashtaroth well who is baal and who is ashtaroth well they're both mythological gods baal is associated with life and fertility so he's the male god per se and asherah 
was the, and he's also known as the sun god, let me just say, all right? Asherah is the moon goddess, and she's also um, known for fertility. And the Assyrians would call Asherah Ishtar, which is where we get Easter from, but that's a whole other topic for another day. So this goddess of fertility, uh, the moon goddess, and the sun god of fertility were the, were the two gods, mythological gods, that the nation of Israel was serving. And so we find that um, Baal and Asherah are usually mentioned together because according to the, to the myth, they're a husband and wife kind of team. And so the Phoenicians and the Canaanites worship these two deities. And those were the uh, people, the Canaanites were the people that were dwelling that land that is known as the promised land that's flowing with milk and honey. And so these people were worshiping these two deities. And so the myth goes this way. The Canaanite, Canaanite god, which is Baal, is the god of life and fertility, and he was he's in this battle against this god named Mot, M-O-T. And Mot is the god of sterility, listen to what I'm saying, and death. Now, why is this important to know? I'm not here to promote Greek mythology, but what I'm here is to share with you why this nation of Israel was worshiping these two gods. When you take a look at what a drought is and what a famine is, the drought and the famine are both what? It's a scarcity. It is a dryness. It is um, sterility, barrenness, death. All right. So these people thought, wow, we're experiencing this drought and this famine because we're not serving these two gods or because we need to serve these two gods. We need to give them something to reverse this drought and the famine, not understanding that the drought and the famine wasn't created by these gods who cannot answer. The drought and the famine came in the form of a judgment from God. Why? As I stated earlier, because of their disobedience, because of their stubbornness, because um, they weren't willing to address the root issue. All right. So the fact is that they were all worshiping these two deities. So, um, in this process, what we find is that in their service to these two deities, it wasn't giving them the result that they expected. It wasn't giving, and it wouldn't give them that result because they need to worship, we need to worship the one and true living God. It is not until we worship him, it is not until we go before him and seek him out and repent for our wrongdoing, or at least check in with God, Lord, Lord, where am I right now in terms of um, my lifestyle? You know, some areas we know are pleasing to him, and other areas we know are definitely not pleasing, but then there's that gray area where we're not quite sure, and that is the moment where we reach out to God and see what that altar that I have in my life, because we could have many, that altar in my life, who is the source of that altar? Again, this is the question God's been asking throughout this entire series. Who is the source of that altar? Who's the source of your altar? Who's the source of my altar, right? So God was opposing this worship. And you might even be asking yourselves right now, I still don't understand what the big deal is, all right? That's okay. I'm going to explain this to you next week and answer that. What is the big deal? Why is God making such a big deal about the worship of these false gods? All right? So we're going to address that next week. Apostle? The big deal? Girl, I'll tell you what the big deal is. The big deal is, very seriously, though, the big deal is that we were born to worship, mm -hmm. right? So we're going to worship on someone's altar. And I right. choose to worship on, on the altar, altar of God, of God mm -hmm. the one who answers by, by fire. fire. Mm -hmm. Boy, you got to get that one too. There's a she has one of the part of the series, and it's it asked that question: who who will you worship? The the God of Baal? They had this little bitty cow up there, or the God who answers by fire? Mm -hmm. We choose for as for me and my house, mm -hmm. we choose the God 
who answers by fire. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, powerful, powerful word. We thank you, Father, for this word. We thank you that even as this word has been delivered tonight, Father, that, Father, that is going forth in a great and powerful way. Yes, Lord. And that, Father, you're the one who answers by fire. Yes, so we Lord. pray right now that you would, you would come into the lives of those who are watching this yes. uh, right now and those who will even be watching it at a later time, Father, that you would respond to their, to the choir of their heart, their desire to grow closer to you, to have a better understanding of, of, of the altar and a better understanding of worship, that you would answer them as the God who answers by fire. That it would be crystal clear, Father, that you are the only true and living God in their lives and that their altar belongs to you, even as the altar in, in the Cobb house belongs to you. Yes, Lord. So we thank you for it in Jesus' name. But now you may be you may be thinking, yeah, I wanna I wanna get there. I wanna have that opportunity to really understand uh, my my the fact that I've been born to worship and that there is this opportunity that I have to to grow in that aspect, right? Mm -hmm. So. You know how that's going to take place? First of all, you have to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, mm -hmm. right? Because he's the connector. He's the one that introduces us to the God who answers by fire in a very personal way. Mm -hmm. Apostle has delivered the word of God. You've heard the word of God. But now you have an opportunity to say, Father, I believe that you are the only true and living God. So I believe in your son. And if you if you're thinking that in your heart, if you're knowing that right now in your heart, then you are desiring to become a son or daughter of the most high God. So we're going to help you take care of that even now mm -hmm. by asking you to participate in a prayer. Now, the prayer is nothing spooky about this. It's only addressing what you already believe in your heart, that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead. And according to Romans 10 verses 9 and 10, when that takes place, you shall be saved mm -hmm. it's as simple as that so you already believe it in your heart and you really right now you're ready to confess it with your mouth so that's what we're going to ask you to do so as i pray this prayer apostle is going to pray it along uh, with me um, you just repeat after me and just allow god and the holy spirit to introduce you to the true king of kings and lord of lords jesus amen so as I pray, just uh, repeat after me. Father God, Father God, I recognize that I am a sinner. I recognize that I am a sinner. And I've done things that are not pleasing to you. And I've done things that are not pleasing to you. I repent. I repent. For living life my way. For living life my way. And ask you to forgive me. And ask you to forgive me. I believe Jesus is your son. I believe Jesus is your son. That he died. That he died. And, he blood, and he shed his blood at the cross to save me. At the cross to save me. To save me from my sins. To save me from my sins. That he was buried. That he was buried. And that you raised him from the grave on the third day. From the grave on the third day. Jesus. Jesus. I ask that you come into my life. I ask that you come into my life. That you be my Lord. That you be my Lord. And that you take control. That you take control. I give it all to you. I give it all to you. My faith. By faith. I believe that I am yours. I believe that I am yours. And I will spend eternity with you. And then I will spend eternity with you. Now I ask that you help me. Now I ask that you help me. Live the life you died to give me. Live the life that you died to give me. Through the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the power of your Holy Spirit. I ask all this. I ask all this. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 <laughs> well, that's powerful stuff. The God right now who answers by fire has brought that fire in you Amen. you have it within you right now the power of the holy spirit the power of our lord and our savior jesus christ nothing excites us more than that amen so, you know apostle yeah let's just um pray over every heart that is tuning in tonight mm -hmm. and we want to pray that the god that answers by fire that he would heal your heart that he will heal your family, heal yeah. your home, wherever healing is required. That's what we want to pray over you tonight, Amen. if you allow. Mm -hmm. So, Heavenly Father, we do. We, we thank you for tonight's teaching, Lord God. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would minister to every person 
that has tuned in to this series. Mm. We speak your blessing over each and every yes, one of Lord. them. And we ask that you would heal their heart. Yes, Father. Heal the minds that need to be healed in the yes, name Lord. of Jesus. Heal the families that need to be healed as well. Lord, we're just speaking a physical healing. We're speaking a spiritual mm. healing, a healing of the soul, a healing of the heart over them, Father God. Lord, we know you as Jehovah Rapha, the healer. Mm. And so we release right now in the name of Jesus, we just release the healing power yes, of God by way of your Holy Spirit yes, into every person, mm. Lord. Yes. That is tuning in to the series. Yes. Touch their hearts right where they are, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Yes. Some have been experiencing back pain. We ask mm. that you heal that yes. back pain as well in the name of Jesus. Mm. Some have broken bones, Father. We ask that you would just heal, heal yes, those Lord. broken bones, Lord God, where mm. as the doctors may say, it'll take an X, X amount of time. We ask that you would work supernaturally yes, Lord. in their lives yes. to speed up that healing process, yes. Lord God. In the name we pray of that Jesus. if they don't know, if they don't have an altar set up to you, Father God, and maybe they were mm. fearful of the message and fearful of the cost, the Lord God, that you would just minister to their heart by way of your holy angels right now, Lord God, mm. that there would be a peace that surpasses their human understanding yes. in this hour and that that peace would overtake them and speak to them, Lord, and let them know that this prayer is a good prayer, Lord, mm. that it yes. gives them eternal life, Father God. It gives them uh, uh, an inheritance, Lord God, not only on the other side of heaven, but on this side of heaven. Mm, Lord, that yes. they would know that being with you is truly a joy, Heavenly Father, and that you can fix those areas in our lives that need to be fixed, Lord God. Yes. We just speak your healing over them yes. in this hour and that you would heal their mind, Heavenly Father, even in this hour, Lord yes. God. So we thank you and we praise you as we send your healing power mm. into their lives right now, right Father now. God. And I just see where some of you are even receiving mm. that and feeling this yes. jolt in your mm. heart. Just know that that is yeah. the Holy Spirit beginning yes. to work in you. Some of you are saying, what is this burning that I feel mm. in my heart? And it is the burning of the Holy Spirit mm. that is working in your heart. And the purpose of it is really just to bring you closer to the Lord. Amen. And we ask that God would heal your finances as well. Yes. Some of you are struggling. And I see where some of you are, are at the point where you're about to lose your home. Mm. And Apostle and I, we just mm. come into agreement yes. right now. And we ask the Lord to just put a stay mm. on that process. Yes. We ask God to work an mm. awesome miracle in on your name of Jesus. behalf. Yes. In yes. the name of Jesus. So that you don't lose the roof mm. over your head. Thank We're you, asking Father. for Jesus Christ, the kinsman redeemer, yes. to come in and redeem your mm. situation yes. right now in the, in the name, name of Jesus. Of Jesus. Yes. Amen. And I even feel that mm. some of you are have children who have strayed away and you're, you feel like you're at wit's end and you don't know what to do anymore. Hmm. So we're asking God that God would give you wisdom on the words that you can deposit into the life of your children Amen. that you feel have strayed. And for your children, we're praying for a healing of their soul in the name of Jesus hmm. and the healing of their mind as well. And that God would heal their body and that whatever it is they're craving that opposes God, that would that they would no longer crave it, hmm. that in fact, that's they it. would find it detestable, that they yes, would uh, have a bitter glory, taste glory, 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 in glory. their Thank mouth, you, uh, the bitter taste within them. And they say, oh, hmm. I don't want this. We're asking God to heal your son and your daughter yes. miraculously hmm. right now yes. in the name of Jesus. Name and that God would Jesus. set them free by hmm. the power of his Holy Spirit yes. in the name of Jesus. And that the only Jesus. altar in their lives mm. that would be established is the altar of God. So <laughs> we're releasing the altar of God into your yes. family's life as well. And we're doing all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 With the God who answers mm -hmm. by yeah. fire. Amen. Well, listen, we got to run, but we're not running away from the God who answers by fire. We're running towards him. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so until next week, just remember this that the fire is in you. Amen.
Amen. Good night, everyone. God bless you. Good night. <laughs>